July 26, 2024, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar, you know, I tried to go live at the right time and couldn't do it because I had to restart the computer and all that good stuff. It's Friar's Day, by the way. And uh, I even tried getting BP, my co-host, for the past few minutes. I can't reach him. So I don't know what's going on. I think I'm broadcasting. Hopefully I am. I know it's being recorded one way or another, and I know I got open phone lines, so I guess you guys can give me proof of life here. <laughs> it is what it is. I know I saw him drop his video of the week in the chat room, MeadowChelly.com. Anyway, 319-527-5016. I am currently flying solo. Which is not good because I don't want to give my opinions and points of view on Friday. This is for you. And how do you do that? 319-527-5016. You call in and you let me know what you think about anything. Doesn't matter. I mean, we, we've talked about the fast food industry in the past few weeks. We have talked about uh, hypothetical situations, courtrooms, uh, obviously the, the, the political chicanery and madness and clown show has been part of the equation and discussion and the revelation of the conversation as of late. And a little bit before airtime, I think I released the podcast from yesterday. Um, I only did two full live shows this week uh, previous to this one. Aaron Franz will be with us live, by the way, with the Age of Transitions at 10 p.m. Eastern. So that is promised this week. And Uncle will be live at 11 p.m. Eastern. But uh, up until then, it's you and me and maybe B. Pete if we can find him. 319-527-5016 that's 319-527-5016 or you can reach out to me charles.ocelli on skype anyway uh, oh, oh if you do that i'll call you into the show don't call me because it just disrupts things anyhow the news of the week I mean, you know, what else is new? There's always got to be a shocker. I mean, how are they going to even maintain interest? Is everybody going to fall asleep by the time November comes and goes? Anybody thinking about Christmas in July? Uh-oh. That might be BP making a lot of noise with music and stuff. What's up, man? I don't know. I just looked at my phone, and it's and I pulled up Skype, and it said, join the conversation. And I thought, I didn't hear ever hear a ring. Oh, you don't see that I rang you three, four times? Well, I'll tell you, I've Skype, been sitting here reading the room and listening to St uh, Steve Winwood traffic. Wow. Well, I, I was getting, you know, I, I called you. If you look back there, you'll see I called you. And uh, well, this is the second week in a row that the the normal tone that boom boom doesn't go off. I mean, mm. otherwise I'd have picked it up. Well, you know, there's been a whole. You had to reset the. I saw where you had to reset the Java. Well, see, I'm not in the regular room because right. of feedback. I'm in the chat tango room, so there's no audio. Oh, uh, well, but here's the thing. There's been weird stuff going on with me trying to call people and message people and all kinds of crap this week. Um, and I don't know what's happening. Somebody told me that they're not getting my messages on X. You know, the, the Twitter what? platform, and they're like, I go to X, it tells me, you know, it sends him an email notification that he's getting a message from me. And uh, the, the one guy I had on Musician last night was telling me the same thing. He's like, I get the notification, I go to the messenger, and there's no message. <laughs> and I'm like, but I'm sending you messages. And he's like, yeah, I know. Then I had a guy try to sign into his Skype, and they, they kicked him off of his Skype and tried to make him, you know, prove who he is again. Um and then other people are telling me, you didn't call me. I'm like, I called you on Skype. I've been calling you on Skype. You know? Well, this is the second week in a row that the normal ringtone has not gone off for Skype. And so I was sitting there reading the room, and I switched over to YouTube. I was getting ready to cut it off. I picked up my phone because it was on the charger. Right. I said, well, shit, something's because something, I checked the volume. Volume's up on my phone. I should have heard the ringtone. But when I looked at it, the little green light there next to your name, said join call so i get that yeah well but, but the reason why is because i weird. i added you to a call and called you that's why you can join in because it told me you were unavailable <laughs> i said okay no, I was it should have had a green dot next to it i, I 
logged on about 7.30. No, nope, it said you were unavailable. I've been calling you since about, like, I, I was less than a minute late getting started. I wanted to be. And then I'm playing a song going, well, oh, where's BP? What's going on? So, yeah. And and I said to hell with that. I, I went live. Out. Yeah. But I still would have heard the tone because the phone's right here next to my computer. So even though I had the... I was listening to YouTube. I would have. I always hear it. I'm usually listening to YouTube because gotcha. I can't hear the room in Chattango. So until you call, I figure out. Oh, okay, we're uh, seven minutes late. We're far from the courts. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be unusual either. But I was trying to get you on time. Hey, look, we got a caller. Let's take him, and then I'll do this. It's a little out of order this week now, but I'll, I'll check in and get your uh, your week review as soon as I get through with the first caller. Let's get him on the line first. Anyway, you're live, and uh, what's on your mind this week? Uh, this is Danny here in Northern California. Since there's nothing been going on in politics, I heard Jimmy James talk about he had some Watergate information. I'm curious what he had to say when he comes on, and I'm ready for football season. Oh, you're ready for football season. Well, I know, uh, BP, are you ready for football season? <laughs> I'm, always, oh, I'm, ready for, I'm ready for NFL, not this summer Sandlot League crap they've got on, the XFL or whatever the hell it is. Uh, don't, USFL. Is it the, the rebooted USFL? Is that what it is? I mean, yeah. is it the same yeah, teams they had in the 80s, uh, BP? Remember that? Well, no, there's some of them, but there's some different, you know, there's a lot more franchises now. Oh, so, but okay. it's, I mean, you're watching third stringers, four stringers. Right. And Donald Trump doesn't own a team this time. Not yet, anyway. No. Uh, um, he was the part owner of the Jersey Generals, in case people forgot, <laughs> years ago. No, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, a lot of celebrities that have a, a partial ownership in a sports club somewhere. Oh, yeah. And it's just a method that they use for diversifying their money. And if they have to, they can always, you know, write it off as a loss. So. Yeah, but what major league? T- I mean, unless you're, uh, you know, unless you're the WNBA, uh, what, what you know, what sports franchise is going to be a loss, uh, really, right? Well, no, I mean, if you look at all of baseball, because you've got rookie league, you got farm leagues, rookie leagues, uh, single, double, triple A, and you know, every team has got about six or seven farm teams. So hmm. every major league team. So you look at baseball nationwide. Um, the Statler brothers, Dolly Parton. I mean, a lot of people in Nashville have got uh, partial ownership of of teams. But it started, believe it or not, uh, one, well, one of the biggest owners was uh, Francis Crockett, who was Jim Crockett from uh, wrestling fame. Her, uh, his daughter. Oh, no kidding. She had, yeah, she had ownership in like seven or eight different teams. Wow. Well, um, yeah, Jim Crockett was a uh, major, you know, back when there was more than one uh, wrestling corporation. He was pretty big. He owned a whole whole serious NWA, territory. What's that? Was it NWA he was with? I'm pretty sure that was his. Yeah, I mean, he, he owned the stuff. Uh, Crockett Promotions controlled, I think, the Southeast for a long time, you know, until the WWE trashed everybody. But anyways. Yeah, I worked, um, when I left the, the Kinston ball team, I went to Charlotte and I was, was uh, selling tickets during the off season for them. Hmm. and ran into a bunch of wrestlers a couple of them uh you know would help out on the field crew and that hmm. but uh you know it was kind of neat she would uh this was the old charlotte coliseum where they used to film their matches oh yeah well yeah. I, I know they had uh, definitely wrestling matches out of charlotte i remember nature boy rick flair talking about it anyways oh, yeah. uh, so danny uh, what let, let me get a hint about you you're you're uh you're anxious for nfl but uh you got a team uh you know jimmy james will talk football with you too if you give him a chance uh you got you got a team in mind sure. are you at a california guy because you're close I, to it I, what's I, up I, I, yeah yeah i'm Always, I started out as a as a as a Ra- Oakland Raiders fan, and then uh, wasn't happy as they moved to L.A. and they built a big fan base in L.A. and and I I remember talking to a guy when they moved back up to Northern California who was all pissed off at Al Davis and I go well how do you think I feel now they're in Vegas yeah and I've been to the st- and uh, place I remember the days of Lyle Alzado and that was a hell of a team back then yeah. when we were in Oakland. Well, see, I I remember. Uh, look, 
I love the Raiders along with, and I was also a Jets fan because I, I have a great habit of picking loser sports franchises to follow. But I was a Jets fan in New York and also love the Raiders because they were nasty. They were just, you know, real nasty players. They, they, it was like the Raiders in football and the Flyers in hockey were like exactly the guys that didn't even care about playing the game half the time. They were just looking to beat up the opponent. And by the end of the game, the opponent was so bad they would lose uh and it was <laughs> i used to you know i mean the rangers used to have one or two bullies but uh but but the flyers had a whole bench full of them and the raiders were like that too i mean they were nasty players and it's funny to me that john madden was their coach at one point and then uh you know he becomes uh you know america's sweetheart and the uh you know the guy behind uh what the biggest uh uh, home gaming franchise ever EA Sports cut that deal with them for Madden Football and he's like the the announcer of announcers I mean they're going to probably AI that guy into eternity uh, with his voice and everything and uh, John Madden who used to like I say head one of the dirtiest nastiest teams uh, in the world they were, yeah. they were on top of the game that was the big thing that's all that mattered to Don Madden they were on top of the game exactly no I loved it because it yeah. was just it was hardcore and you know what I played and football as a kid yeah, you know, every team had their rivalry but Oakland took it to everybody right. when Oakland played it didn't matter who they were playing you saw Oakland at their best back during Madden's time yeah and I used to, you know, and, and again, I was a, a Pop Warner player and all that kind of stuff when I was a kid. Uh, literally, I played for a team that, that was in Steelers colors, but was called the Falcons in Tinton Falls. Uh, and also, I was part of a team in, in West Long Branch. They, they were called the Whales, I believe. And uh, we were outfitted like the Dolphins. I hated that. But I liked the Steelers colors, you know, the, the black and gold and white, depending on whether we were playing at home or away. Um, but, uh, yeah, and... I was a I was a nasty player. Uh, I was all about how many different colors of paint can I get on my helmet uh, <laughs> as a defensive player, right? Um, and I would I would literally take the paint off of the other kids' helmets by you know you weren't supposed to be banging heads like that, but I did it anyway. Uh, some people would say that's why I am the way I am today, but not true, not true. It wasn't that or the boxing, I assure you. Um, Anyways, Danny, so you used to like the Raiders, but what, what about now? I, I, well, I, I, I still like the Raiders, and they brought me some of my useful high moments of, uh, of football. They, I mean, I, in the 70s, the Super Bowl was the Steelers and the Raiders for the AFC Championship game, mm. and I had my heart broken with the, what they called the Immaculate Reception. And I thought they were going to the Super Bowl. They were beating the Steelers seven to six, and that ball bounced off Jack Tatum. Hit, I think he hit Lynn Swan, and the ball, the ball bounced into Franco Harris's hands, and he ran it in the end zone. It was that was pain. That was my first real painful um, <laughs> sports experience. Yeah, it, that was painful. I remember in my living room and just in shock and. Uh, and Jack, I read Jack Tatum's biography. It's called "They Call Me the Assassin," and he hated Franco Harris. I will not call you, repeat the names he called Franco Harris. Uh -huh. And he said Franco Harris was walking to the bench, and he just so happened it fell in his hand. You know, I got a question for both of you before I move on to the next caller, and it is—it's a real strange one because you're bringing up the Steelers, and I remember the Steel Curtain. Obviously, again, if you're thinking about me being born in '72, the Steelers were coming off of four Super Bowl victories, which was an amazing thing at the time. Um, and, you know, today you get Terry Bradshaw. I think he's still doing announcing stuff, right? I know he does commercials. But, you know, yeah. at, at that time when I was a kid, though, and I don't remember exactly when this happened, but Mean Joe Green becomes an icon with Coca-Cola, right, because of this whole weird commercial mm -hmm. where he throws the kid a jersey for because he took his Coke or something like that. And I have a question about yeah. that. When the hell did Mean Joe Green become a celebrity? Uh, that sort of surpassed everybody, including Bradshaw and all that. When, when did that happen? That commercial. I mean, was it that commercial that did it, that or commercial. did he get that commercial as a result? I mean, what 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 went down there? No, he was good. He was an excellent player. I mean, he had high stats. Yeah. Um, but they picked him for that commercial, and that's what launched him. I mean, it changed. You think about it, Mean Joe Green. You know, 
kid offers him the coke he's walking away hey kid and he throws him the jersey you know it's it's iconic because mm. he's he's supposed to be like a nasty hardcore player and he's being a nice yeah. guy to the kid so thanks mean joe yeah, he's limping. <laughs> see he's limping when he when he's walking down the hall right and the kid hands him his coke so yeah it just it changed the whole persona thing but that's what launched him he was always an excellent player mm. he's a big dude yeah. agreed agreed Agreed. I mean, I was no Steelers fans, but I, I respected them. They were great. Yeah. yeah, I started out professional with the Oakland, Good. but my, my first love with any with any football team, I was four years old, and that, that happens to be Notre Dame. I'm a big, huge Notre Dame fighting Irish fan. Ah, okay, so with the college ball, too. You know, the other celebrity from that time period, which was uh, amazing to me, and I have no idea how he became a celebrity. It's, I'm not like a big football historian. Baseball, I know some history, but football, not so much. Um it's weird because the other guy who was big was uh, uh, Bubba Smith, and the reason why is because he was in uh, he was in uh, what was it uh, Smokey and the Bandit movie, I think, and he tackles a car. I think that was it, and then and then he gets into the Police Academy movies, and Bubba Smith's like you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, like a weird comedy celebrity. Uh, and then, of course, O.J. gets in on the Naked Gun thing a few years later, right? But, I mean, I don't remember how Bubba Smith became a celebrity. I, he just was there, you know? Uh, along with Mean Joe Green, I guess, you know, I didn't realize that Coke commercial is what made Mean Joe the celebrity. But uh, but he was always a good player. But Bubba, was Bubba Smith a good player? I don't even remember him playing. Bubba Smith yeah. is excellent. He's, he's another one that was really good. Yeah? Okay, see, these are guys I didn't really know. I was just starting to watch football, you know, and the Jets were still crying about Joe Namath, you know, by 79. Bubba Smith, <laughs> Bubba Smith was probably one of the first guys to pull the swim move. Mm, you know, where okay. where you'll yeah. reach, you'll spin and you'll reach over and basically break through the line with your arm to get through. He was he was good at the swim move. So and like, it just opened up a hole. I mean, he he was in the backfield in no time. Ah, uh, okay. So he was that kind of guy. He was like one of those, like really fight it out really well and use his his whole size advantage and all that kind of thing. Oh hell yeah! Okay. He'd throw you all over the field. <laughs> I nice. Mean, if someone my size, he'd pick me up and toss me like a dwarf. Nice. I, all right. Excellent. I, you know, I, I, I love that though. I mean, I just remember these guys as the celebrity again. Um, you know, I remember, like, I never saw OJ the, play either, really. You know, you had the steel curtain. You had the flying purple people eaters in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. You had, um, you know, that's back when Butkus was playing. Um, that was that was Butkus. football at its best. Mm. Mm. Quarterbacks. Quarterbacks are too protected now. These guys, they used to take hits that most quarterbacks couldn't take today. They're oh, not yeah. conditioned for it. Oh yeah, like uh, I'll never forget that that night that Joe Theismann got his leg busted though. That was oh, oh yeah, Lawrence Taylor man. He said oh, man. I almost got sick when I saw the replay. I thought, holy crap! That was right. Lawrence Taylor said he almost got sick. Yeah, well, well, LT was kind of sick in the head, uh, but uh, no, just you know, from the sound of it, he said the sound is what he remembers. Oh yeah, I'm sure it was something that they were but not used to hearing. That's another iconic hearing. moment in football. You know, people that saw that saw a game when the game was at its best. Mm. That was a damn good game between the Giants and the Redskins. There you go. But, uh, you know, again, I was watching stuff in New York, and I remember at, cer- at a certain point the Jets had to play in uh, in uh, a Shea Stadium even. Um, it, it, was, it was a weird time, too. There was all kinds of things going on, and the Jets would always, you know, how are they going to blow it this year? It, it was like, oh, you're a Jets fan and you're a Mets fan, too. So you enjoy disappointment. Guess, yeah. too. What's that? I said, I got a question for our guests. Did did Las Vegas also get their hockey team from California, or was that a new franchise? I think that the Knights was a new franchise. But I oh okay. I, I went to the Scamhawk series with my son and grandson to Vegas, and I'm telling you, that is an amazing place to watch a football game. I was pretty impressed with the that the the stadium there in Vegas. I would yeah. like to check it out. It looks, I mean, on TV, oh, it, it looks impressive. Hmm. 
it, 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 it's the temperature's perfect. The view's perfect. Where you go up to get your food, I mean, they they, they had they were doing like these carved roast beef sandwiches. There's a a pizza. Uh, place in North Beach, San Francisco. It's Tony G. I can't pronounce his name, but it, I've had his pizza in San Francisco, which is considered some of the best pizza around. Uh, it's delicious. So they had his pizza, and they had a huge bar. I mean, it was just all of the stadium. You could get access to really good good, good food. Is that Not the cheap, is that the guy? In, wait a minute, quality. Danny. Is that the guy in San Francisco who's got an absurdly long Italian name? That's like like eighteen yeah. meters long. Okay, I tell you yeah. something weird. Yeah. Uh, I was told that like I can't remember his name either, but I was told that somehow like we have cousins in common. This guy, I, I don't know why that did that. Just pilot. yeah, I don't know why, but uh, yeah, but he's got some ridiculous like it's got two apostrophes in it or some nonsense or it used to. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and it's like this horrendous I, I, Italian I, I name. Yeah, try, I don't even try to pronounce it. I don't hear his name enough to, to really have it sink in. But just to give you an idea, I, I mean, right by his west end, you can get it by the slice. Mm. Uh, my son and daughter-in-law, when they moved back from L.A. To, to Northern California, they went to work in the tech industry, and they lived in North Beach. And I would drop, when their first child was born, I would drop my wife there on a Sunday night. Mm. And we'd, we'd go there late Sunday afternoon, and you could just smell the food. It's the Italian district there in, in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. Oh, and yeah. we would have some dinner there in yeah. uh, North Beach, I've and never... I'd go home to go to work. Cool. But, yeah. I've ne- exactly. Yeah, I've never been to San Francisco, but he's got some ridiculous name like Giapanluca Momonichi Monaco. You know, like, yeah, exactly. it's like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, they just call him Tony G. They call it Tony G. Yeah, right? you're better off. Yeah, because, it's really good. Because I don't know anybody who can pronounce that name. Uh, you know, so yeah, somebody spelled it out for me, and I said, God, that's ridiculous. What happened? I mean, did they, like, you know, uh, did they, like, put two people's paperwork together at Ellis Island or what? And uh, and they were like, no, that's actually a name. And I was like, come on. Well, yeah, well, believe it or not, he's actually our, you know, third cousin over here. From I'm like, come on. Really? Of course. You know. Anyways, I'm going to put you on hold, man, because we got other callers. But I'll come back around to you, Danny. No worries. Um, and uh, I think... We have Jimmy James on the line, and then I'm going to get into B. Pete's week real quick before we wind up taking a break because time is flying already on a Friday night, and you can join us, 319-527-5016. You never know. Could be football and pizza on the discussion. Could be Watergate. Could be the latest political debacle. Uh, uh, you know, who's demented, who's not. <laughs> Do we have any more demented candidates out there? Is there anybody else with some, you know, braid damage or old age beating them up is there some elder abuse we can talk about is there something crazy going on i don't know i didn't look today uh anyway this week what secret service uh head resigned etc cetera, etc cetera. but who knows it's not about what i think it's about what you think and i think we got jimmy james on the line jimmy is that you yep and danny's in luck because for weeks all i've been doing is wallowing in watergate wallowing in watergate Okay, so a couple of things. Um, you sent me a clip. Uh, well, you sent me not a clip, but you sent me a, uh, a, a a marker to tell me where to look on a particular show. And, uh, and I went and I found it on YouTube so that we could play it. But uh, I was wondering what the importance of that clip was. I wanted to talk to you about it. Do you, is it an important clip or am I just... It, it, does it mean anything? There is no important. There is no importance to it other than it was the first time that the young Roger Stone perhaps got a shout out from alternative media. Mm. And that's our nineteen seventy-seven. Yeah, nineteen seventy-seven, right, Jimmy? It was uh, May Brussel. Yeah. Yep. She pretty much summed up everything he did. Mm. But now nah, that's. Not really important. Okay, fair she enough. Was, she I, used to, but you know what's I, weird? You know what's wild about May? Hold on a second, Jimmy. You know what's wild about May is a lot of times uh, she would go off on tangents and she saw Nazis under every uh, bed. But outside of that, she would, you know, sometimes sum up like uh, 
six months worth of news stories in about five sentences and just blow it out where it's like, you never heard of this guy? This is who he is. This is what he did. This is why he's important, and this is what's going on behind the scenes. Next, and she would just, boom, 20 seconds, be done with the guy. Um, And I don't hear anybody in alternative media who can do that. Uh, you know, I, I, I take 20 minutes <laughs> to, to like, you know, really dress somebody down in alt media circles. Um, and I go on rants, which are, you know, melodic sometimes and uh, occasionally poetic. But she used to just sum stuff up really concisely. Bang, 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 bang. And she wasn't talking fast, but she was at a good pace. And it didn't sound stressed, and it wasn't, you know, with any wild enunciation. It was just sort of like, and then this guy did this, and then he went over to here, and then this happened, and then this is a real thing that's actually going on. And the whole purpose of it is to destroy this guy. Moving on, you know, like, next, you know, and she didn't say next or anything, but she would just seamlessly, you know, go from Nixon to Manson to Roger Stone to back around to Bobby Kennedy, something new in the in the JFK case, and then a couple of things going on in the prison system, and oh yeah, that reminds me about the old story that everybody didn't pay attention to from last year about Manson, and now the mainstream is uh, actually admitting it happened, and boom, 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 and she would do this for 45 minutes. And I'll tell you, that's pretty damned amazing. Even today with a, you know, a million people with their podcasts, you don't find people who can very concisely and precisely, um, you know, consolidate all that information into a couple of sentences, like I said. Anyways, I, I found that amazing, and I listened to that clip, and I was like, yeah, she summed up everything real fast, told you who, you know, she absolutely believed was actually undermining Nixon, which uh, is not the typical story that you would find everywhere. Uh, and uh, I'm more on her side than I am on the typical story side, i got to tell you. But um, it's amazing what she would do on that show. So I'm, I'm glad you sent me that, though, Jimmy, although I come to find out that the, uh, you know, the reason why the May Brussel uh, Research Library is no longer communicating with me is because they got 501c3 backing from a nonprofit organization uh, that I find interesting, the Romero Institute. And uh, now, you know, even the YouTube channel doesn't have the May Brussel project name on it anymore. So mm, I don't know. They just stopped talking to me. I think uh, maybe the Romero Institute doesn't agree with me. Is it because of their relation to the Christic Institute? Possibly. Uh, anyway, nobody knows what the hell I'm talking about, Jimmy. Sorry. Uh, go, what What is on your mind with Watergate? What is of importance this week? Well, I've been taking my continual deep dive in the Watergate. And, uh, yeah, of course, I later remembered Hogan's allegations and you'll be interested that no one that I've been reading or listening to disputes his allegations in fact most of them build on it Uh, so I've been reminded again of Hogan's work and uh, what was Laden, what was his name? But from the 1990 book. You're talking some of about the older works. Yeah, you're talking about uh, Jim Hogan. Uh, you're talking about Jim Hogan, right? Yeah, from the 70s. And then in 1990, uh, there was another book, kind of old now, but what's that guy's name? Well, anyways, some of the newer information. Anthony Summers? That, Are you talking about the Anthony Summers book? Nah, it's after that. Okay. It came out about 1990. His name's like uh, Hispanic, if I recall right. All right. Well, let me see what I can get here. Um, let's well, see. it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter because all these people pretty much concede to these two people's points. Mm. They they pretty much, uh, and the first person, of course, I was spoke about before, his name was Jeff Shepard, and he was one of Nixon's attorneys. Mm -hmm. And he did his best series, in my opinion, is if you can find it, if you look for him, 
he did a college course for Temple University, and he's got like 13 episodes, 14 episodes there, and they're very good. Hmm. Now, I wonder if Joan Mellon ran in. College- I wonder if Joan Mellon ran into him because she was a, you know, I wonder if Joan Mellon ran into him because she was a professor for many years at Temple University. And well, I did. I'm sure they would have. Yeah, and the, the, the Hogan book that you're talking about is Secret Agenda, and that's by Jim Hogan. It was released in 1984, according to what I read here. And I'll put the link in the chat room at oh. com for everybody. If you oh. haven't read this or you're not aware of Jim Hogan's work, Secret Agenda, I got to tell you, uh, to me, it, it still stands quite well, even 40 years later. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, his main ideas uh, absolutely stand up to scrutiny in my mind, in that book. Anyway, go ahead, Jimmy, right. sorry. Well, hold on, this, this, this gets expanded on. Uh, not only does this guy that's a lawyer and college instructor, he says, basically, oh. someone brings up the Jim Hogan book. He says, I like Jim Hogan, and I'm actually fond of his ideas, but Due to this being a college course, if you want to discuss that, it'll have to be after the class. Because uh-huh. the main thrust of his classes was an insider's view, because he was literally there. And he's just got all kinds of interesting things. And he focuses on basically his re- focuses were on how Nixon was cheated because the prosecution, the judge, and the Congress, and all sorts of people were working together, which is illegal, and legal matters, ex parte, they can't be doing that. Mm -hmm. And he covers all that beautifully. So then I found another guy's work named John O'Connor. Now, his work is called, uh, well, let's see, The Mysteries of Watergate. Now, he, again, he, he's got no problem with uh, Hogan's work. And actually, there, that guy in the 1990s expanded it, the idea that there was a so-called prostitution ring running. And the idea that John Dean was actually trying to get information about his wife removed. That's pretty much the allegations of the earlier researchers, right, Chuck? Mm, Yeah, that's one of them. Um, John John O'Connor is an interesting guy, by the way. I I am friendly with a John O'Connor. And the funny thing is, I'm not sure if this guy is the author of that book or not. Uh, the John O'Connor that I'm friendly with, weirdly. Uh, but but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no. Well, this guy's he's got a very interesting podcast and book about it. And oh, O'Connor has a podcast. Uh, boy, he just huh? When did O'Connor start a podcast? I don't know. Well, this is, it's actually from four years ago. It really? It's a limited okay. podcast, and it's pretty much a summation of his book. So oh, oh yeah, okay, okay. After okay. Uh, yeah. Jeff Shepard's Temple series, I would say go through this, and you'll find out such interesting things as Michael Stevens. Well, who's he? Well, he was the bug manufacturer fabricator that James McCord picked to make the bugs. Uh-huh. You'll also find out that the bugs were that were installed were satellite bugs, which creep, and no one in the White House would have even had the equipment to listen into. You would have needed a satellite for that. Mm. Uh, you'll also find out that Mr. McCord was mysteriously bailed out by, uh, out of jail by a man named Lee Pennington. Mm -hmm. Uh, and nobody knows who this guy is. The CIA told everyone to take a flying height. 
Mm-hmm. He says, don't, don't worry about who he is. Don't bring him up again. So they didn't. And of course, the defense knew nothing about any of this. Well, what's funny well, is, uh, yeah. Jimmy, what's funny is how many of these dead-end guys are involved in the Watergate affair? There's a bunch of people whose identities lead well, to nowhere, isn't here, there? Here you go. Right. Well, here you go. There actually was a sixth burglar, and his name was Lou Russell. Mm-hmm. Now there's some crazy Cuban guy running out there claiming his dad was the sixth burglar. Well, obviously not, or else he would have known about Lou Russell, the mm-hmm. actual sixth burglar. What did he do? Well, he was listening to the taps. What did he say that he kept hearing under oath? And this was mentioned in Jim Hogan's books. He said, well, mostly I kept hearing a bunch of what sounded like perverted private talk. Mm-hmm. Well, in Hogan's, yeah, it went away. The committee did never mention Lou Russell, never mention Michael Stevens, never mention this weird man Pennington, all of whom were very much connected to James McCord, mostly, and his uh, Mullen and Associates. And yes, they were all CIA connected. But I think in this case, it's more for reasons that we now know, based on the work of Dr. John Newman. Of course, James McCord was a Soviet mole. Mm -hmm. Not only was he bungling the burglary, burglary, whatever. Burglary, yes. Mm -hmm. He actually brought his own man with him that none of the other burglars knew about. That's right. why he kept leaving the burger, Larry. Well, here's the other question, so Jimmy. Man, here's the other question. Hold, hold, hold. Yeah. I, okay. I, I have another one of these mystery man questions for you, though, because I don't remember if it was in Hogan's book or if it was in one of the early, you know, insider. Um, they didn't claim it was a nonfiction book uh, by an anonymous writer. But there was a, a crossover here where they had a young guy who was driving at some point. Now, nobody's ever said he was part of the conspiracy, but... This young guy goes in and out of this conspiracy and is driving people around, uh, making sure that people get dropped off at certain locations, you know, where they can't be parking cars. And um, it's not a taxi driver, and nobody's ever tracked down who that is. Um, Do you have any idea who that is? At one point, somebody tried to claim it was St. John Hunt. But uh, I don't think so. Even as a teenager, I don't think this was the guy who was driving around Watergate burglars. Uh, you know, the, the Cuban guys especially. Um, you know, who, who do you know anything about that? Well, I'll take a wild guess and say that it was, let's see here, either Russell Stevens or Pennington. Yeah, because nobody ever names him, nobody ever goes after him, and it's weird because it's like, hey, we don't even need to know who that is. But the guy's driving, if he's driving people around and dropping them off, he's obviously got pertinent information. So why did nobody go and find out what was happening? Yeah. This Donald Connor guy absolutely buys your guys' theories on the purpose was basically him and Jeff Shepard and all the authors' conclusion is that John Dean was mostly responsible and he was trying to get information to not embarrass his wife. My conclusions are a little different. Okay. I think that James McCord was piggybacking yet another CIA operation or just making one and getting intelligence for the Russians. Well, I think multiple because things. So yeah, multiple things were going on here, and I think the absolute purpose, uh, the primary purpose in my mind, was to, uh, to was to undermine and get Nixon removed. Now, as for the why of that, you know, I, I, is it merely because of what went on with Dick Helms? Because Dick Helms would be exactly the guy who could tap on a lot of shoulders and wind up putting this thing into. Uh, you know, who else would have gotten Liddy and Hunt together? I mean, realistically. Um, I, I, so what? what is your thought on that? Is Helms at the center of this? 
for multiple purposes. No, no. I don't believe. No, I don't believe Helms was involved with at all with Watergate. In my opinion, so far, I mean, I'm open to. So far, the way I think things went down is it appears Magruder and Dean were the mommy and the daddy of this thing. Okay. I don't even think John Mitchell was knowledgeable at the time. They told him after the fact. Mm -hmm. And he may or may not. He, he, He wanted to fight the thing in court, but his lawyer went, well, I don't, well, he tried, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a weird thing. To- it's a weird thing with Mitchell, true. But um, but but the reason why I keep bringing up Helms is because look, who else would have had off the shelf guys that nobody is even going to bother to acknowledge existed, right? Who else has uh, guys like that, absolutely. right? I I I I will tell you that Mr. Soli, who was James Jesus Angleton's boss and also a Soviet mole. Mm-hmm. Pretty much had the power to make things like this happen. So you think Why that's he be working with the court? Yeah, because you know these guys basically have you know a phone book of assets that they can call upon, you know, to put into action. When you need somebody to be there but never be proven that he was there and not actually exist, you know, a guy who shows up who's got ID and everything else, but when you go to check, the guy doesn't exist, um, and then he disappears. I mean, that is a fairly unique asset uh, back then to have guys who knew how to operate and also had that non-existent ID was something. So, but you think that that's Angleton's boss, huh? I think he, I don't know that Soli was the top guy on this. I mean, McCord definitely is involved. And since Soli was technically a court superior. I mean, I don't know how Russian spy rings run. Mm. <laughs> but I did find through the Mary Farrell that the Stevens guy, yeah, he was a known bugger from the 1950s. The FBI had records on him. He was an official CIA employee. He was contracted at times. He directly worked for McCord's Will Mullen and whatever. So he was quasi CIA. This is what everything keeps going back to McCord, which makes me think that I don't know. I just don't know if this. I mean, I'm open to it. I traditionally always thought it was the CIA versus Nixon. Mm -hmm. But with these revelations from John Newman, that there's just and there's just all kinds of Soviet moles there. And there's also a part going on behind Watergate that I'm still not clear on. Apparently there was, quote, unquote, a military spy ring mm-hmm. operating in the White House. I still don't know exactly what the devil they're talking about. Well, see, that. but th- this is why guys like Gordon Nobel become useful, right? Because, you know, a guy who has some electronics expertise, a little bit of a specialty, who nobody wants to claim, doesn't actually have a legit job or a connection, you know, where they become quasi-assets, stuff like that. Um, and uh, Nobel's just one of the more notable characters because he was quite a character, right? But um, but these other guys, it's it's just a weird nexus that comes together. And I think that reveals a lot of who the real hands were that were actually, you know, holding the strings. Is when you can really sort out where all these assets came from, I think you're going to come up with a combination of things that could have only originated from a very limited list of people. Um, and look, I, I, I enjoy this kind of talk. I don't know what you think about it, B. Pete, but we are going to take a break pretty soon. And I want to try and take some more calls. And besides that, Danny might have questions now that you brought up all this stuff. Um, maybe we'll put both of you on when we come back. What do you think? I got one more thing. Oh, you got one more. Got one Go more quick thing that I think fascinating was that the cash found on Dorothy Hunt was not creep money. Mm-hmm. It was John Dean money, which he made Liddy take to Florida, and Liddy thought he 
squandered it, which he didn't because they didn't take them much effort to figure out exactly what he did. Mm. And you're talking about the money that was uh, that was in her vicinity when she died after the plane crash, the ten grand they found or whatever that money. Right. Yeah. yeah. And on her smoldering purse and corpse, and there was some kind of message written on the hundred dollar bill, though I can't. On one bill, I can't remember exactly what it says offhand, but. Well, another bizarre thing. Unless somebody's got a photograph of that hundred dollar bill, I would think that a message written on a hundred dollar bill is uh, likely closer to urban legend than reality. That would be one of the dumbest damn things to do in the world to write a message on a hundred dollar bill that you're expecting somebody to either deposit uh, somewhere or. It wasn't exactly a message. It's just more like to or from, and then like initials, or it wasn't like. Hey, this is what's going on. Nah, it's just like a few. Yeah, it's but just interesting. It almost sounds to me like it's it's part of the urban legend, though. You know what I mean? Uh, because you know, like like the guy who says he heard the gunshot when uh, what, what's his name there uh, uh, blew his brains out. You know, um, and and turns out he was you know not even in the state at the time. Uh, Demoran Shield, right? When Demoran Shield died, there was a couple of people that claimed to have actually heard the gunshot, and then later it turns out that they, they didn't. Bill O'Reilly said he was outside the house, right? And there was another guy. Yeah. And there, go ahead. Didn't get the fancy here. No, not not Gaten Fonzie. Gaten Fonzie was trying to approach him, and uh, and then uh, Mark Lane and a, and a group of other people had heard the recording at the inquest, but somebody who claimed to actually have been there, like at the moment it happened, I'm talking about, and uh, Bill O'Reilly claimed that at one point, but then we found out he was full of crap. You know, uh, big shocker there. But yeah, that, yeah. That, that's when I realized that Bill O'Reilly is not a purveyor of truth. No, he's a he's a good performer. You know, he had a shtick that was working for him quite well late '90s, going into you know post 9/11 reality. Uh, uh, I was an avid watcher of Bill O'Reilly in like say 1999, 2000. You know, he was inter- even if I, I agreed with a lot of what he said, but even if I didn't. Uh, I found him fascinating as a broadcaster because his his shtick was entertaining. You know, no spin zone, and then he wouldn't let anybody talk. He would spin things, not let you talk, yell at you, and then go to commercial. You know, hilarious. Um, except the night that Marilyn Manson kind of, you know, put him in his place and wasn't just a uh, doped out, you know, complete uh, uh, zombie. Uh, you know, which I think O'Reilly figured he had an easy, easy target there. Uh, but outside of that, I, I kind of liked the way O'Reilly was unfair to his guests and kept wondering why they kept showing up on the no spin zone, you know, when Fox News was like building its balls. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I noticed you had a tendency to do that. Everyone would complain about it. Yeah, and look, I was so much of a listener and, and watcher of Bill O'Reilly that I think I own three of his books. Uh, one of them on audio and two that I actually, you know, sat down to read. Um, and it was all, you know, it was all, all right-wing hype and all. And things were better in the old days when I was a kid in New Jersey, uh, Bill O'Reilly. So, you know, whatever. Anyways. I'm glad that the only thing... And the first thing I ever looked at uh, at by him was JFK, which just happens to be something I knew about. Which so and he, I immediately pretty much knew what he was about right after that. I was like, okay, this guy's full of more crap than an out of. Well, which which part of the JFK thing did you come in on? Because back in the days when he was doing Inside Edition, uh, you know, he was out there making allegations. And, you know, we talked to Gaten Fonzie, and Gaten Fonzie told us that, you know, this and this and this. Good. In the 90s, I seen him as a totally different, of course, from, yeah, like you said, that other show where he would actually show so-called conspiracy angles in the JFK thing, one of the few places. Right, and then he started writing his Killing Everybody book series, right? You know, Killing Kennedy, Killing Lincoln, Killing, uh, I can't even remember everybody. What was it, Killing Truman? I don't know. Uh, how many How many people was he, uh, you know, the killing uh, of this one and that one? Yeah. Killed them all. Yeah, killed them all. He's killed them all. The, the Kill Them All book series. The thing series. in the 90s he did that was wonderful was buying, he did find that one that one tramp 
and interviewed him. Yeah. And he assured everyone that him and his buddies didn't kill anyone. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I got to tell you, I actually believe the story that Bill O'Reilly ran, not because Bill O'Reilly ran it, but, you know, because there was backing for that in my mind. And the stuff that people tried to make it out to no, be, I, Howard Hunt and all I, that, yeah. I think that one thing he did great in the yes. 90s, I believe that that was the tramp that they always call Hunt. He, he wasn't. Right. This guy said, no, believe me, I'm the guy. It wasn't us. Right. That's he, one thing where I'm like, eh, thanks, Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, there, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll thank him for that because that was good. And, you know, it, it also wasn't Chauncey Holt. It also wasn't, you know, uh, any other Watergate people. It just was these three guys <laughs> who did look strange, but. They just look strange. It's nothing. And that's that's the amazing. And people will still go back to that and go, I don't know. You look at the guy's ear, and I think it looks like, come on. You're giving me ear print evidence from a blurry uh, black and white photograph that's been blown up 80 times. And, oh, by the way, you know, you're using a digital version of that. So what, what do you got? A whole lot of nothing? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Fletcher Prouty. All right. So <laughs> what are you going to do? Jimmy, I'm going to put you on hold. Uh, but we are going to come back around, take a little break, and I still haven't even checked in with B. Pete about his week, have I? Damn, we are way behind. Uh, B. Pete, I'm going to take this break, give you the opening, and then let you figure out how we should bring those two back on if nobody else calls in. What do you think? Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, you got to take this next half of the show, man. I mean, we got to hear about your week. And then, uh, yeah, I want you to conduct the conversation between Jimmy and Danny because Danny wants to know about Watergate. Danny's interested in football. I know Jimmy is, too. So you might get a little Watergate, a little football, a little God knows what. And also, whatever you guys, you listening, you out there, if you're hearing us live, uh, about three minutes to 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, in that place we used to call America, on the clock, right? Almost 9 p.m. Eastern time as we are live on a, a Friar's Day, a Friday night, the 26th day of July, 2024, on the Ocelli Effect. And guess what? <music> Lastly, the number to call in is 319-527-5016, 319 or... Send me a message, charles.ocelli on Skype. Ask me to, and I will call you into the show. Otherwise, 319-527-5016. The Ocelli Effect Friday Night Open Mic will return after this. Go ahead, caller. Hey, I'm interested in the truth about the JFK assassination. Right. Well, what do you want to know? Judy Baker's wild claim, Oswald girlfriend, he knew Ruby and Barry, cancer weapons. Really? I imagine I could claim I have four wheels. It doesn't make me a wagon, but okay. Oswald was on the kill team and trying to prevent the murder of John Kennedy. Come on now. Has a real effort on the JFK assassination book into her claim? Go to Amazon.com. Enter Judith Baker in her own words. You'll get results for a digital copy of a book where Walt Brown utilizes her own words and the known evidence in the case to get at, well, <laughs> a different perspective, let's say. You can get Judith Barry Baker in her own words from the author himself, signed, if you request it, by contacting Dr. Brown at K-I-A-S-J-F-K at AOL.com. It's a fun book, and it actually dissects the many, many fantastic claims. Judith Barry Baker in her own words. Thank you for all the great information. In denial, Secret Wars with Airstrikes and Tanks by Larry Hancock. Secret Wars became a staple of U.S. covert operations and are still happening today. Larry Hancock's book, In Denial, rips the cover off many of them. Using new files, it exposes things about the Bay of Pigs that no one has ever written about before. It shows why it really failed and why the United States did not learn from it. It also shows why other countries today are doing secret operations with more success. This is the book that puts what some want to deny into the light. In Denial, Secret Wars with Airstrikes and Tanks. Larry Hancock. For more information, go to Larry-Hancock.com. Pick up your copy of In Denial at Amazon.com in digital or physical form. 
The War State by Michael Swanson explains the great national transformation that took place and put the Kennedy presidency in the context of the times and reveals never-before-published information about the Cuban Missile Crisis. President Kennedy would not have been assassinated if he had been president 200 years ago. His assassination took place in the context of the Cold War and the rise of the national security state. Before World War II, the United States was a continental republic. In the decade that followed, it became an imperial superpower. Generals such as Curtis LeMay not only wanted to invade Cuba, but knew that there were short-range missiles on the island armed with nuclear warheads that they could not destroy because they were on mobile launchers. Their invasion could have led to a third world war, and they wanted to go to war anyway. The war state by Michael Swanson reveals why and will show you what President Kennedy was up against. For more information, thewarstate.com. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you're listening to the Ocelli Effect at Ocelli.com. <laughs> Do you like history, real history, that you were never taught in schools? Why? The Vietnam War, nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia. By author Mike Swanson, with new documentation never seen before. That will open your eyes to events that led up to this. Why? The Vietnam War, nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia, 1945 through 1961. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Why? The Vietnam War by author Mike Swanson. Uncle, do you remember that time when Benjamin Fulford said that an Asian secret society was going to dispatch ninjas to take down the Illuminati? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and the cartoon. Yeah, did that ever work out too good? No. It didn't, did it? It didn't work. But here on Ocelli.com Radio Network, things work out a bit better, don't they? Much better. Much better. I mean, it's clearer in understanding about the programs... The programs are much clearer. Getting live people into it, they really have a good conversation going. Much better. Much so, better scene. I say forget Benjamin Fulford and his ninjas and yeah. listen to the Ocelli.com radio network. I agree. It's straight to the point. Straight talk. And I like that idea. Ocelli.com. The War State by Michael Swanson explains the great national transformation that took place and put the Kennedy presidency in the context of the times and reveals never-before-published information about the Cuban Missile Crisis. President Kennedy would not have been assassinated if he had been president. Do you like history, real history, that you were never taught in schools? Why? The Vietnam War, nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia. By author Mike Swanson, with new documentation never seen before. That will open your eyes to events that led up to this. Why? The Vietnam War, nuclear bombs and nation building in Southeast Asia, 1945 through 1961. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Why? The Vietnam War by author Mike Swanson. The views expressed by callers, tools, or anyone else who happens to get on the air at Ocelli.com do not necessarily reflect the views of Ocelli.com or Chuck Ocelli. And we are not responsible for any stupidity which might ensue. Thank you. The Ocelli.com Radio Network. Get ready, get ready for the Ocelli Effect. are back for segment number two of the live open mic on ocelli.com i had a little miscue there might have accidentally started to play the war state a second time during that commercial break but uh we're gonna have some new spots soon uh and uh we're, we're also gonna have to eliminate some that are on the network at the moment because uh sponsorship support things like that are changing and uh not really changing for the better so anyway it is what it is, and uh, I had a few people actually ask to be removed from the archive list recently. So, uh, you know, it is it is how it's going. Patreon down, everything is on its way down, looks like to me. Uh, is it just me, or is everybody getting paid less while all the costs are still going up? Oh, that's right. They told us the economy was getting better. Anyways, you can tell us all about it if you want or anything that's on your mind. 319-527-5016. 319-527-5016. That's the number to call to get in on this. Or reach out to me, Charles Dottocelli, on Skype. And if you ask me to, I will call you into the show. My co-host, B. Pete, we didn't get to open tonight. 
by asking you how your week went, what's on your brain today, nothing. Uh, I wonder if you wouldn't give us just a couple of minutes of, you know, that, because we missed it at the top of the show. Sometimes you give us a weather report, and then we'll transition back into callers. If we get a new one, we'll put them up front. But otherwise, we might let Jimmy James and uh, Danny talk to each other a little, uh, I'm thinking. But up to you, brother. Uh, How was your week? Let's go there. My week sucked, basically. <laughs> okay. I mean, we have been hit with rain. I mean, it sucked out loud. Um, we've been hit with rain every damn day. The job site's been shut down. We haven't done anything in five days. So, I mean, it's it's been that bad. Mm-hmm. Everything has been training up the coast. And we get it during the day, and then we really get it bad overnight. I mean, thunderstorms that sound like you're sleeping in the bowling alley. It's been pretty intense. I'm getting ready to go out in the morning and put some pontoons on my lawnmower. <laughs> pontoons? I'm going to the front yard. Pontoons on the lawnmower. But, uh, that sounds like a... It, uh, yeah, it's, it's... Yeah. Sorry. We've had flash flood warnings um, all over the place, tornado warnings, stuff like that. When these fronts, And finally, this front is moving through. So my sinuses will quit screaming. But other than that, I mean, it's been it's been a very hectic week. But I would like to say, you know, put a note out there to all the powers that be that they got to change their damn schedule because I get tired of stuff happening the minute we go off air on Friday night, <laughs> crap starts happening, and we don't get to talk about it for a week. So by the week goes by, and you're tired of talking about it by the end of the week. Mm. So they need to redo their schedule, or either we need to switch to Monday night. Yeah, plan yeah, plan your resignations and political scandals and you know, alleged assassination attempts and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean it's it's really getting hard to stay up with it, but right. you know, by the time the end of the week gets here, I've heard so much crap this week about two shooters and three shooters and four shooters and five guns and oh, five shells and yeah. three shells and did you and did you see the, the water tower? I'm sorry. Did you see Mike Adams thing about how like no shots were actually fired by the kid crooks? Did you see that? No. I'm, oh, okay. No, Mike Adams. Mm-hmm. Which Mike Adams? The health ranger, Mike Adams. You know. Yeah, that guy. I'll have to. You got a link to that? <laughs> I'll get it for you. I think I put it in the chat room actually, and said, uh, and and said, Jimmy James, give me your reaction to this because uh, I think Adam states that you know he's been reviewing the video and the pictures, and uh, you know, dude, he says, uh, yeah, this kid never fired a shot. Why is the gun seven feet away from the body? Blah blah blah. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I I, I am not responding to this, but I figured. Uh, I would let Jimmy James have at it. I don't know if he looked at it, but I put it in the chat room. Yeah, please do take I'll a look at it. Well, I'll, I'll go and look at it. But it's been, I mean, some of the stuff that I've heard, some of the stuff I've heard makes a lot of sense. Some, some of the stuff I've heard is yeah. just that shit crazy. But see, that's so, the thing, is you got... That, I, yeah, you you got conspiracy theorists, you know, going going full bore conspiracy theorists. You got official explanation defenders and and all that going, you know, full tilt boogie on that BS. And then you got, you know, the Trump the Trump narrative. But there is a whole lot of other crazy out there that I can't even put in a box. Um I mean, it's it's weird. The people that are defending the real situation, in my in my opinion, the people that are making excuses and making it into something larger than it is. I mean, AJ goes live on Saturday night. Emergency broadcast. Uh, there's been a coup against the United States. And I'm like, a coup against the United. Wait a minute. This guy's a candidate for president. Oh, hold on. Are you talking about Biden? Uh, you know, dropping out, which that also happened this week. And I'm tired of talking about all of it. I don't even want to talk about Kamala at this point, right? Because I'm sick of it already by the time we get to Friday. So, yeah, I concur. Uh, can you please stop doing I mean, stuff you know, on Friday night the, and Saturday? Uh, what, what, yeah. The part that ticks me off, <laughs> and it, it's just come out the past couple of days, and this is the coup de gras. They are already wiping uh, websites of quotes and stories yep. about Kamala. Yep. And and I I really have to make myself say Kamala because the only other Kamala I know was a wrestler. 
and the Ugandan he, giant. He said it was Kamala, not Kamala. The Ugandan so, giant, anyway, right? The Ugandan giant, yeah, Kamala. The Ugandan giant. Well, yeah. <laughs> I love um, that guy. <laughs> yeah, think about it. that's the only other. That's the only other Kamala you know. Um, it's just it's crazy. But when they start trying to rewrite history, I mean, I just how stupid do these people think the public? really is that's what amazes me these are mainstream news sources out there you know just handing out the same piece of paper with the same bullet points and they all are reading from it yep it's so hilarious that i just can't believe that they actually think the public is that stupid that there's not some people out there that are going to call them on it yeah, but the shocker it's is amazing. the shocker is BP. The public is that stupid. Number one, number two, um, yeah, <laughs> that's where we're at. Uh, and and by the way, I, I guess you didn't live in enough black neighborhoods. I've known plenty of people over the years tangentially that were named uh, uh, Kamala, but they were all Kamalas, and uh, yeah, they were generally girls, and uh, they were not of mixed heritage according to them. You know what I'm saying? They were black. Uh, and that was that. And they, you know, it's like all the girls named Tunisia and, you know, Kamala goes along with just those names. You know what I'm saying? Um, those, those. Well, I've never, I've yeah. lived all over the United States. I've never run into another Kamala. Yeah, no, there's, there's plenty. I mean, I, every neighborhood I used to move into, there was two, three, four of them. No problem. I mean, it wasn't quite as big as Jennifer in the white community, but it was kind of like, uh, kind of like a Stacy. As a name, Stacy was as popular in the white communities or, or the mixed communities as, say, Kamala was in black communities and mixed communities. So, uh, yeah, no, Kam- Kamala, I saw all the time. This Kamala, which is a slightly different drag on it, is new to me. So I don't know what the hell's up with that. Um, but, you know, yeah, you got to stop yourself almost every time and say Kamala. Uh, instead of, yeah, Kamala, I, I the Ugandan you, giant. It's, it's amazing how far <laughs> she's gone. Now, this this is a person that never had a single primary vote in her favor. Not as she's president. She's never been no. in a primary. And Not, here she yeah. is, supposedly going to take the helm of the Democratic Party for this election. And they, only in America. Think about it. Did, did she win in America? Could you not even have to run in a primary and you could be president? Well, wait a minute. Well, she ran in primaries just not for long, right? No, uh, she didn't. No, she got out before the first primary oh, when okay. she ran. So when she did that debate and everything, that was before the first primary? I barely remember this now. Remember the debate yeah, where it she's was before like. Before the first Okay. Did she ever run in a primary when she was, uh, you know, in California, though? Did she ever run? I mean, because I know she didn't, she didn't make it in the presidential primary. Cool. But did she ever run in any is, primary? Is the AG in, uh, is, is the attorney general of San Francisco, uh, they run for that? Uh, I, I know she was in that primary, but this is somebody that was has never been in a presidential primary that's getting ready to take the helm and, and be on the ballot and could win. All right. Yeah, no. Good win. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, no. She she ain't doing that. But uh, I mean, let's see. Uh, let's... I mean, that's how this whole week's been, and trying to keep up with it. it's been hectic and go and work. Uh, we've had stuff blown apart at work. I've mean, just got so much water on the job site. We've had like two inches of rain a day, two inches of rain at night for six days. It's, it's been it's been hectic trying to stay on top of it. Fair the biggest thing is the assassination stuff. Trying to stay on top of that it's almost impossible. But I did find a story that I know you're not going to hear anywhere else. Seventy four percent of all deaths directly linked to COVID shots. Autopsy data shows mm-hmm. this group of American oncologists, cardiologists, doctors, and scientists. There's some pretty big names in there. Did a study using autopsy reports, and they're saying that uh, a Demi new study has revealed that autopsy data shows COVID mRNA shots have overwhelmingly contributed to all-cause deaths around the world. They've done the study and says it's uh, COVID shots are directly linked to 73.9% of all deaths. Mm. 
now. When are you going to hear that in the mainstream media? Oh, mainstream, forget it. I, I, I've seen that published on a couple of sub stacks that that happened, but I, I wasn't certain that anybody would speak of it anywhere. Yeah. And, and very quickly, I did some research while we were in the break. There are 13 editions in the Killing series by Bill O'Reilly, <laughs> and he kills, let's see. Go ahead, list them. Uh, he, <laughs> King Reagan. Killing Kennedy, yeah. Killing Jesus, killing England, killing Patton, mm -hmm. killing the SS, mm -hmm. killing the Rising Sun, killing Crazy Horse, killing the mob, killing the killers, and killing the witches. And then he's got his thirteenth book is a combination killing Lincoln, killing Kennedy. Oh, oh okay. So he put so that out the, later. That combo okay. book, huh? Do what? He put out that combo Kennedy and uh, uh, the Lincoln book uh, later. It was like a second edition kind of deal. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, I was not aware of that. I, and it all started with the killing Kennedy thing where, you know, again, like I said, depending on which point in, in O'Reilly's career, you never know what point of view he was going with, you know, as far as the uh, assassination. Is he a pro-conspiracy guy or not? All the way up till he published that, where basically, you know, the Warren Commission got it right, according to him. Except he wants to point out yeah, a few but, discrepancies, yeah. Well, and that's why I was asking about this Martin Dugard. Bill O'Reilly writes books by <laughs> hiring someone to write the book for him. Yeah. He doesn't spend a lot of time on these books. He comes up with his general bullet points he wants to make. Is left up to somebody else to put it together. Yeah, well, it kind of sounds like you know Dick Russell's uh, job when it comes to writing with Jesse Ventura, right? I mean, basically, yeah. Dick Russell pulls that's together that's the research it. and the and the raw guts of the thing and says, "Here's the proof for the for the crap that Jesse just said." You know, on the last page, right? I mean, isn't that the way that's that that book team runs? Go ahead. And you can find all of his stuff at Macmillan Publishers. There you go. And Roger Stone, another guy who had, you know, various co-authors with him. And he doesn't really do all the work. <laughs> he has somebody else do it. You know, I, I don't understand all the big to-do about Roger Stone. He seems to me, I don't know, he seems to me to be one of those persons that will interject himself into a situation. But I don't understand what the big deal is. I've never understood where he either contributed or didn't contribute or caused or, I mean, so he was responsible for what? Dirty tricks back during Nixon's time during elections? No, no, you know, no. That's no, a no. claim to fame? <laughs> no, that's not it. That's where his career begins, okay? But he's involved with, you know, the Willie Horton thing. He's involved with various presidential campaigns. He's involved with a whole bunch of different campaigns. But he's never the guy who's up front. He's but one of those behind he, the scenes. How involved in the Willie Horton thing? I don't remember exactly. But I do remember he was part of that that maneuver somehow and he was part of just a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of greasy some of the you know uh, revelations that turned up some of the uh, a whole bunch of the stuff from you know different scandals a lot of the initial reports some of the stuff that floats out there in like the in the inquirer uh you know uh, uh media circles and stuff like that that later on turns out to be true in some cases it was roger stone coming up with it and he was involved deeply in the dc seen so to speak um it's just that he got busted swinging with his wife and once that happened that was unacceptable so they sort of uninvited him into that weird inner circle where he was able to work behind the scenes for a lot of people also he was running trump's campaign at one point and he had been friends with trump a long time so this is why he came back into prominence, but he also has these series of, you know, conspiracy-based books. He's a Johnson killed Kennedy guy and all that. Um, and recently when I had Joan Mellon on, uh, we talked about it, I think, on air uh, about Roger Stone.
and and the weird thing that went on with her. Which, by the way, here's the clip. I'm just going to play this real fast, uh, uh, B. Pete, and then I want to get back to the callers. But here's a partial clip of that May Brussel saying that uh, Jimmy sent me by email for me to listen to. And he's like, hey, that's probably the first time that Roger Stone got mentioned by, you know, sort of an outsider media outlet. So, you know, this is back in 1977 when May is broadcasting out of Carmel, California, uh, doing, um, I think it's Conversation Conspiracy, it might have been called at this point. Either way, it's from, uh, what is it, November of 1977, no, no, not November. Let me correct myself. It's from uh, May, May 9th of 1977. And uh, here's that clip real fast, just a few seconds of it, to give you an idea of May Brussels sort of wrapping around on Roger Stone real quick in 1977. Your tranquilizers. Another payoff was Carl Feldbaum, the former assistant Watergate pro- special prosecutor, and he was named to uh, just recently the Defense Department as the Inspector General's post. He's been promoted to the U.S. Defense Department, and it was the Defense Department that was working to get Richard Nixon out because of his stand towards opening up Danton with Russia and China, and a far the right wing group was sabotaging Richard Nixon, and one member of the special prosecutor's team has now been named to the defense inspector general's post in Washington, D.C. Another young gentleman by the name of Roger Stone, who had the alias of Jason Rainier during the Watergate Dirty Tricks, is now organizing with Mr. Ugary in Washington, D.C. and in the Southwest a plan to make the entire Congress a far-right Republican by the next elections, if possible. And this is very important because of the sabotage against a members and Congress that have been infiltrated by the Korean CIA and the the scandal will just break at the time of the next elections. This gentleman was cited by the Watergate Committee for Sabotage and Espionage and never charged for any crimes. He now is very active in Young Americans for Freedom, which sponsored Spiro Agnew in the first place. Even though Agnew is out of office and not running now, he says he could run again. He said that last week. He could win and he could run again. And the same people that were behind him at the time of Watergate are working harder now. It was the same Roger Stone that hired a Michael McNenoway, who was sedan chair number two at the time of Watergate, and he he was paid $5,000 by Charles Colson to send money to Pete McCloskey and say it was from the Gay Liberation Front and some more money from the Trotskyite Young Socialist. And then they drafted anonymous letters to the Manchester, uh, New Hampshire newspaper to William Loeb and said that McCloskey was getting money from Trotsky Foundation. Foundation of Trotsky contribution. See, <laughs> it's weird stuff like that that Roger Stone ends up doing, right? You know, turns around and uh, uh, literally directs a donation to somebody and then alerts the newspaper, hey, this guy's getting money from a communist organization. Stuff like that, you know, these kind of tricks and things that he was always involved in pulling and masterminding, actually. And uh, this is this is what made him useful as an like, operator. To me, it just sounds like run of the mill everyday crap in D.C. Well, except you know, I don't see where he was. Well, but he should be a celebrity over it. Well, but if he's a high level operative at that, and he's a mover and a shaker in those fields, and he literally dreams this stuff up in order to smear people, in order to, you know, turn the electorate against them and literally influence elections constantly uh, by the fact that he's involved in who can get the most mud on them faster. Um, you know, what can you say? It, it, the level of influence that he had there was probably pretty high because his name kept coming up with everybody, and yet nobody ever would bust him for literally doing something directly illegal. Uh, He would be on the fringes of stuff, just on the outside of illegal operations, uh, just on the, you know, definitely on the side of uh, morally precarious situations one way or another. Um, And, you know, his personal uh, orientation being that he's a libertarian, believes in everybody's personal freedom, uh, you know, supports LGDP, you know, supports all that kind of rights uh, until it, you know, becomes the rainbow flag it does today. He used to be a gay rights supporter, all that stuff. Um, And weirdly, he would mainly work for the most right-wing people he could, 
But when it suited him, he'd go and work to try and get, you know, if he needed to split a Democratic vote, he'd go and, you know, get the socialist guy to get a little bit of traction in an election. Turn around and get somebody knocked out of Congress by splitting the Democratic vote that way. Stuff like that. Yeah, um, that stuff, I mean, well, but what I'm saying is, is those are everyday things. Those are everyday occurrences, and they've been going on in politics since politics. But I just don't see where he's become such a celeb because of it. Well, because I mean, if he I don't was, know, maybe it's because he hasn't had to pull any time. I, who knows? But, but I just if he's literally the guy, who, thing. if he's literally the guy who's creating a lot of this stuff, I mean, not finding it out and then just revealing it, but literally creating it, making sure it gets revealed, and directing political scandal after political scandal on mass like on a daily basis this guy might be responsible for a lot of the static that's come out a lot of the corruption a lot of the weird you know why is this person getting money from china if he's responsible for that stuff as opposed to just being an operative who digs up dirt you know instead of doing opposition research he's creating the opposition research right well, um, that's been going on. All I'm saying is there's been people doing that, especially since the 60s on, mm-hmm. when you had student groups that were working for each party. I mean, this is – I just don't understand how he's worked it into a celebrity status, let's but, put it that way. Well, but there were 50 guys who came up with the, you know, with the personal computer concept, and there was 100 guys who came up with the operating system concept, and only one of them gets to be Bill Gates, and only one of them gets to be, you know, the guys from Apple, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, whatever, because they are prolific, and they do it better than everybody else, and maybe they do it 100 times more than everybody else, right? So I think that's what it is, is that Roger Stone is like, Look, there's a lot of Major League Baseball players. Not all of them are the best home run hitters, but they're valuable people. And who do you who do you celebrate? You celebrate the stars. This guy's the star of, you know, what they called at one point muckraking and the manufacturing of uh, you know, of scandal as well as, you know, direction of scandal. He's supposed to be the best at it. And to tell you the truth, I think he is. Because, I mean, he's got his fingers in a hundred things. You know, he's not one operative working for one party or working for one little group of people or sticking with one candidate. This guy's, you know, pretty much been all over the place. So, you know, at a certain point, if he gets 50 people into Congress that might have not made it without his uh, manipulations, uh, it looks to me like you can you can actually, you know, make a case that he's fairly powerful. As an operative, right? And if he's the best of the best, there you go. What do you think? I don't know. I still don't get it. I just don't see. I, you know, I'm sure that he's involved in a lot of stuff, but is there a lot of stuff he's taking credit for that he had nothing to do with? But nobody knows, so nobody can call him on it. I just, I just don't understand the celebrity status of Roger Stone. I would think he'd be not shunned, but... You know, who would want to have anything to do with him at this point? Mm. I wouldn't. If I were running a campaign, I would. I mean, there's, like I'm saying, there's guys that's been doing what he's doing for a lot longer than he's been doing it. And they're so good at it, you don't even know they were involved in it. He seems to have turned it into a, a way to become a celebrity. Let's put it that way. Well, look, there were a lot better and better money makers than John Gotti as a gangster, right? There were a lot of guys who had higher body counts, who had ordered more people killed, who controlled larger mob families than John Gotti, right? But you know who John Gotti was. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and at the same time, Maybe he is at the top of the influential list for the people that, you know, again, he he was not long ago in Donald Trump's camp. And after that, he worked with a whole bunch of other people. He's done a lot of stuff. You know, I don't think it was just uh, um, loyalty from Trump that bought him the pardon he got. You know, again, well, I, that was one of the things I didn't like about Trump when Trump ran the first time is his association with Roger Stone. I thought, you know, this this is not. Between that and his pick for his spiritual uh, um, advisor, Paula White, 
Mm-hmm. Between those two right there, I didn't want anything to do with Trump. Still don't, really. Yeah, but see the result, though. See, that that's the thing. is doesn't matter how dirty you feel about it. If the result is the result, then who cares, right? Did John Gotti get the job done? Did John Gotti control his family? He sure did. He ended up going to prison eventually, but he walked away a lot of times, and this is what made him a legend. So, you know, here you go, right? So this guy is a legend because he is out there letting you know his name and still operates and has operated now for, what, half a century as a political operative. If you go all the way back to working with Nixon, right? And Nixon, he kind of had a minor role, I thought. But, you know, over time, you discover more and more stuff. There was a lot going on there. And uh, the guy was not just working for Nixon, okay? Anyways, let's get to the callers and stuff before we kill all our time, right? Sure, yeah, if you just want to bring in Jimmy and, and Danny and let them, uh, I'm sure Danny's got some questions for Jimmy. Okay, so. On what Jimmy's been going over. You want me to grab uh, Danny first and then uh, and then let Jimmy on while Danny's talking? Yeah, I, I, that'd be a great way to do it. All right, so Jimmy, you prepare and uh, we'll bring Danny back on. And of course, anybody else who wants to call in, we will get you in before the end of the show. And Aaron Franz starts in about 30 minutes uh, here on Ocelli.com radio with the age of transitions at 10 p.m. Eastern. And then that'll be followed by Uncle at 11 p.m. Eastern. I think Aaron is still not taking calls on his show, but Uncle takes calls on his. So uh, stick around, Ocelli.com. Plenty of call in radio left. So, Danny. Uh, you've been listening to all this, and uh, then we broke into Roger Stone and all that. But I'm going to put Jimmy on with you so you guys can just converse about this uh, and only interrupt you uh, if we get fresh callers. So it's on you, man. What do you, sure. you got questions sure. or you know stuff you want to make a comment about? Oh, I got, I got, I got some comments and questions and thoughts. I'm sorry you had a sucky week, BP. I agree with you, Chuck. That the public is stupid. And I remember, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember reading it, uh, a Bill O'Reilly book because my cousin really encouraged me to want to read it was, uh, Killing, uh, MacArthur because I had read William Manchester's The American Caesar in the past, but maybe I'm wrong. Now, look, he, he wrote a bunch of those killing books. B. Pete listed them. But um, before that, you know, he wrote books about pretty much make America great again, bring it back to the old days like it was when I was a kid in Jersey. Was like four or five books before. I don't remember the names of these things, but they were super popular and they sold really well. And I owned probably four books. I know I had one on audio that he read, and uh, then I had a couple that I actually, you know, had the hardcover book and sat down and read. I actually read Bill O'Reilly's books, uh, and then unfortunately I read Killing Kennedy as well, but uh, after that I was done. You know, we're killing Patton, and we're killing uh, Jesus, and we're killing everybody, you know, in his series, but Killing Kennedy I actually read. Anyways, I'm going to put Jimmy on with you, but but go ahead and uh, uh, go go into your Watergate stuff. Yeah, let me let me go into a couple thoughts, and then then I'll, I would like to hear Jimmy's opinion on it. You know, one thing about May Brussel, I believe she had a degree in Stanford University in philosophy, so she just she was taught how to think and not just what to think. So it was really interesting that clip that you shared. It said that I caught my interest was the Korean CIA. Mm-hmm. And I know that as I'm listening to everything, a lot of this is going back to just always the same circle as Cold War politics. And I don't know, and you also talked about John Dean. I remember reading the book, um, I think it was called Silent Coup, which also kind of emphasized that probably it had to do something with the prostitution ring and is uh, the involvement of Modi in it. And then Jefferson Morley came out with a book not too long ago called Scorpion's Dance, which was uh, Richard Helms and Richard Nixon, the CIA and the presidency. But I, I'm kind of getting this. You know, Rich, Richard Nixon came out of that California, the, the Orange County. It was kind of a very anti-communist, John Birch society type of mentality. So any comments that that maybe I brought out that I would hear Jimmy's thoughts? Hmm. Well, Jimmy's on with you, so go ahead, Jimmy. Well, the, the 
one book you brought up was the one I couldn't remember the title of from 1990. Uh, what can you remember? It's Len, I think, by Len something or another. <clears throat> yeah, it was Silent Coup. I remember I read it when it came out. It was a long time ago. Silent Coup, the removal. The Silent Coup, the removal of a what, president, what? Uh, which was uh, published in 1992 by Len Colony and Robert uh, Getlin. Yeah, yeah, that, that was. Yeah, Jeez, that was could I forget? That. That. Yeah, I don't know how 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 come those names didn't roll off my tongue. Yeah, they're they're Shame not on me. they're not really easy ones. And I had Morley on about that Scorpions dance book, by the way. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, as far as it was Helms also messing with Nixon, I don't know. I don't know. He <laughs> might. I I've always assumed so. But uh, newer evidence suggests that I may have been wrong. Perhaps it wasn't the CIA. Perhaps it's more like the KGB. Mm. Well, see, I would contend that even if it is CIA moles that are working for the KGB at certain points, they might have collaborated together with other CIA people on this particular operation. This may have nothing to do with him being a KGB mole, the one guy you're talking about, and could be a separate operation, right? Uh, so I got an open mind about this. What, what do we have? I, I can only assuredly say jimmy and and i and i say this with with the most conviction possible is that this was orchestrated by intelligence operatives who were definitely part of that world uh and this was the thing that actually brings nixon down it's not that he was such a master criminal it's not that he was so dirty uh you know was he was he completely clean no he was a politician at the highest levels in america you don't get there being completely clean in my mind so but was he basically intentionally targeted by people in the intelligence community and business? Absolutely. Uh, that's in my mind. But, you know, you guys could have a different opinion about it. Go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, can I... Can I yeah. Can I, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Danny. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, go, uh, I remember because my... Uh, my father, he, he was a businessman, and uh, he was a, a conservative Republican. Nixon, Nixon was was who my household was all for, and I remember the Watergate hearings. You know, I was pretty young. I watched it up until I wanted to go outside and play baseball. Mm. But I remember when he resigned. My father said he didn't excuse some of the actions, except that he said, well, the cover-up was the problem, and he was also obviously became paranoid. But he says, once you reach so much power, there's only one way that, that is, is down. Mm. And it's interesting that after there was kind of a detente, he opened up with China and Russia, and then when Ford got in there, who was a weaker candidate, I remember that they taught was it was kind of like starting up the cold war all of a sudden but i thought it was very interesting what may brussels she was commenting about the korean cia mm -hmm. and i believe i'm you know correct me if wrong there was kind of a world anti-communist league there was a lot of they, there was a lot of money that, that saw it as a threat economically, the expansion mm -hmm. of communism. So I could see it if there was warm and fuzzy relations that there would be some dirty tricks to, because I think, I don't, I think Nixon's biggest problem is he kind of obstructed the, the justice and, he, you know, he, he, you know, he made absurd comments like, where it was like, was it, Robert Frost, he goes, well, when the president does something that's not a crime, it just, it was, it was a, it was a weird time, but I remember the reflection only in America that you can remove a president, there wouldn't be a bloody revolution. I, I do remember those thoughts. Yeah, so, no, the, the yeah. Frost, the Frost Nixon interview is profoundly interesting. We have another caller. I'm going to bring Jimmy and Danny back on to continue the uh, Watergate discussion, but I want to give another caller a chance to get on. Uh, 609 area code looks like. 
You are live on the Ocelli Effect, so uh, speak your mind. Whatever is on your mind, go for it. I'm an old friend of this show, and I consider Chuck Ocelli a dear friend of mine. And the whole reason I called in was to remind your listeners to go to Ocelli.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and donate. Folks, we need people like Chuck Ocelli and his guests. Let's keep them going. Well, it's regular Joe, by the way. Ah, that's a six. Okay, that's not a nine. I thought it was a nine oh eight area code. It's a six six. Uh, never mind. We know who it is. Regular Joe. <laughs> it is good to hear from you, brother. Uh, and we heard from you earlier in the week. I didn't know it was you calling in. Yeah, I ran into a crazy problem where I had to change my phone number. So I, I didn't know if I'd ever given you the new one or not. So you, you, I want to save that one. You had not, so I better make a note of it. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll put it in your chat, too, sir. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you. And you, you put it in the chat on Skype. Don't give it to the world, because God knows who will call you, man. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. And, and also... Your, your guests are just great. BP, Jimmy, James, uh, your caller Dave from California. It's just, just it's, it's just always good to tune in and and, and hear the Otelli Network still going. I've uh, been been trying to keep it going as as long as I can. Been over ten years now, and uh, we're still counting, you know. And I appreciate you and your contributions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've been listening and uh, participating in it for nine years now. Can you believe that? Has it been that many with you? I didn't realize that. Nine years. Yeah, yeah. I started uh, started messaging you and listening to your show back in 15, I think. Yeah, I think I was on uh, AFR at that time still, right? You sure were, yeah. yeah. I, I found you through... Uh, Listening to Freeman Fly for the very first time I'd ever listened to him, and I heard the Greek, and the Greek promoted you, and and I've been here ever since. There you go. So the the Greek actually netted me one listener, and here he is, <laughs> which I love. Um, but uh, it, it's it's an interesting story, and uh, going all the way back, I didn't realize it was that far back. Uh, you know, I've come to think of you as sort of a fixture in my life. You're one of my friends. Uh, I talk to you a lot more off air than on air. So, <laughs> um, and who knows? I might even move to your uh, to your area. I mean, we're going to try and move at the beginning of the, this coming year. And uh, it's a possibility I might might be your neighbor soon. I mean, we almost did it a couple of years ago too, but we hit a snag. Uh, but uh, but the thing yeah. is, yeah, I might might be a neighbor of yours coming up soon. <laughs> that would be great. And I'm I'm actually going to try to visit you before fall. I mean, so I, I, I almost I set out to make the trip once, and I made it almost to Chattanooga, and I got really tired and turned around and came home. <laughs> Well, look, man, I, I appreciate you. I, th I thank you for calling in. I didn't didn't know who I was interrupting those two talking with, but uh, but I'm glad. I'm actually glad it was you, and I appreciate you encouraging people to go ahead and hit the donate button. I wasn't even going to say anything tonight, uh, but uh, I do appreciate it because, as I brought up at the beginning, you know, times are tough, and, yeah, I'm taking in less, and everything costs more just like it does for, I don't know, everybody. Uh, so we're all in this everybody. together, man. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to keep it going, but, you know, I, I can't if I don't have help from you guys. It's that simple. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you, Joe. I appreciate all you guys listening. Um, but uh, is there anything you want to add before we go back to the Watergate discussion between these two? No, no, I'd rather just listen to those two go uh, go back and forth on the Watergate discussion, and I'll just uh, bow out and uh, be a listener as I began with the Ocelli Network. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Regular Joe, everybody. And uh, I would give you his Twitter handle, but I think he quit Twitter again recently. Uh, yeah, he did. And... <laughs> And there you go. So not a social media guy, He's, but he's uh, been along for this ride now for nine years. Didn't realize that, but uh, probably one of the longest lasting listeners, actually, nine years. Damn. Uh, BP, when did you start listening to the show? Uh, maybe I put BP to sleep. All right. Well, <laughs> let's see. Um 
I will get Danny and Jimmy back on. So, Jimmy, maybe you wanted to respond to what Danny was talking about? Oh, BP, you were talking to your mute button. Sorry, man. Uh, But, Jimmy, Jimmy, maybe you want to respond to Danny. 2016? Yeah. Oh, cool. So that's eight years right there. You're just one year behind Joe. Um, Anyways, yeah, and you've been participating here for, what, at least six years, right? Yeah, about that, I think, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so Jimmy, uh, nineteen, something like that. So Jimmy, maybe you want to res- maybe you want to respond to Danny, Jimmy, because uh, we got about sixteen more minutes left here in this hour before we uh, have to turn it over to Aaron Franz. So uh, yeah, go ahead, man. Well, thanks to regular Joe for the nice comments and to Danny. I thought I responded to his last comments. What was what was your question, Danny? Um, I I was just kind of some thoughts about you know it always comes back to the Cold War. You know, in May Brussels talks, she talked about the Korean CIA, and that always made me think about some of their activities. I think it was called the World Anti-Communist League, and, you know, now I was thinking more about it, you know, that they were heavily involved with the with the Moonies and, you know, Roger Stone and Dirty Tricks, and it could be KGB. I mean, Angleton's closest friend wasn't it Phil Kilby, you know, and about, it was, uh, there definitely seems like it was a takedown. You know, it was a sloppy operation. You know, they were meant to get caught. So um, it just always seems to come back to dirty tricks in the Cold War because I remember in the Ford administration, uh, all the detente kind of more moving towards some fuzzy feelings with their with their communist foes was, uh, was changing. It was, it was getting a little more. It was uh, thawing out of the warm feeling. So I appreciate what the information you're doing. I find it's really interesting. Well, I, feel like I agree. I mean, that, that's what makes this and the JFK assassination the complications. The, the win. Mm. I mean, you were. You were there, I was there, we were all there in the Cold War. It's just so all-encompassing. I mean, it literally was half the world against the other half of the world. Hmm. And, and who was that other guy that was uh, uh, constantly running for president? I I'm, I'm can't believe I'm blanking on his name. For many years, uh, that was also kind of like really in the thick of things, but was always on the strange sort of outside of it. Uh, he was like a, a continuous <laughs> president. LaRouche, that's it. The LaRouche people were highly active at that time, too, right? Yes, yes. They were involved in a lot of, a lot of crazy stuff. I remember, uh, what was the, the governor from uh, Alabama, Wallace, he ran. You know, there, there, was some, there was some strange stuff going on. I remember it was also, too, I think it was uh, Shirley Chisholm when she ran Peace and Freedom. Mm. Um, well, LaRouche. Kind of on the on, on the, the LaRouche people still exist as an organization. I mean, a few years back, and now it's many years back, but seems real recent to me. I got, like, accosted by LaRouche people outside of a post office in, in New Jersey for a minute, uh, and they were just all about trying to get me to buy a $50 book about, you know, how Barack Obama is a uh, complete, uh, a completely fabricated creation of the CIA and all that stuff. And uh, meanwhile, uh, support Lyndon LaRouche. Uh, and it was just wild. They had like a card table set up outside of the post office in Forked River, New Jersey, uh, which I found strange. You know, like there's an outreach program for you. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was definitely a different time in the 70s. I mean, talk about, you know, you were just talking about Kamala, you know, not winning a primary and this and that. I mean, I, I hearken back always to Gerald Ford being the guy who wasn't elected president or vice president and wounds up becoming president, right? You know, it's like it happened happened. (laughs) and it's weird. And uh, meanwhile, I mean, I I just kind of dropped 
forward into the uh, snitch for the FBI kind of, you know, category because of his time on the Warren Commission. You know, remember, he was one of the seven commissioners. Yeah, but interestingly, I... From what I've seen, did you see that uh, bit I posted about James Jesus Angleton being such a prolific uh, source for the FBI? They literally were saying that they might have to open up another wing. Hmm. No, I don't think I saw that piece. Well, that's pretty pertinent. I mean, this is internal FBI documents. They said he, he just constantly gives us so much information. There's no point of even giving him a, a fake name, this and that. He's an ind- he's already our source. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, look, if you he's got that... Given us, as they put it, voluminous information. Voluminous so information. Question was... Sure. Was it true or was it fake or was it what what was he doing? See, that's there's the problem with Angleton, because sometimes he fabricated things in order to create a response. Right. So, I mean, th- th- this is the issue with counterintelligence. You know, sometimes you create stuff in order to elicit a response from an opponent. Even uh, it's a weird world you get into. You know, I, I always like to point to the uh, how did MK Ultra get started? Well, realistically, they had rumors that turned out to not be true about the Soviet programs. Now, there were Soviet programs, but they weren't the ones that they were being told about. And they create MK Ultra as a response to it. And that thing flowered into a rather fascinating thing of its own, didn't it? You know, I mean. So one wonders sometimes if the counterintelligence people, in some cases like Angleton, will wind up doing more harm than good when they're fabricating things. And I mean, I'm trying to think of this on a very surface level. I'm not a fan of the guy or anything, but uh, but I'm also not one of these, oh, my God, he's part of like the demonic, uh, you know, whatever. It's weird. It's like legitimately what goes on in those strange lands where they create stuff and create fake people and fake institutions and fake operations and fake weapons and all that. And then our agencies, our government people, our above boards people respond and respond to something as if it is legitimate when it might have been fabricated by, guess what, your own people. I mean, it gets into a weird uh, nexus of things, doesn't it? Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, I kind of pity Helms having to fool with Nisenko. I think clearly history has shown that Helms' thought was correct. Of course this guy is full of crap. The KGB was all over Oswald like stink on poop. Yeah, and they got nothing out of him. You know, that was the thing about Oswald. They got zero. They, they were like, you know, wow. They couldn't believe the level of nothing they got out of Oswald, from what I understand. Sure. But maybe their whole point was to get Marina here. Well, there's or another maybe issue. maybe something else. I have, I have no idea because it wasn't investigated properly. There you go. I'm trying to figure stuff out. There you go. And there's the key at the end of the day, right? It's sad when you're getting more information from Ernst Titovitz's book about Lee Harvey Oswald than you can from the alleged investigations, right? I mean, you get more legitimate information about this guy. I mean, they had nothing on him in Russia, right? Or Minsk, really. He was actually in Bela- Belarus, Belarus, however you want to say it. But, I mean, truthfully, you get more out of Ernst Titovitz's books than you do out of any of the declassified stuff when it comes to that time period in Lee Harvey Oswald's life. I mean, it's wild. You agree or disagree, Jimmy? I absolutely agree. And I appreciate Professor Hancock in particular's work in the last year or two of really de 
deprogramming me of this idea that Lee Harvey Oswald was somehow secretly a John Birch Society hard wing Republican. Mm-hmm. Which I just, because everyone in the community always said it, I just, I don't know. I took it for granted, I guess. Yeah, the problem is a lot of that stuff is more about these people's preconceived notions and prejudices than it is about what's actually in the evidence when they come to uh, characterizing somebody. And there was a point in time when the majority of the assassination you know, research community was left wing. Um, it's not like that now. And it hasn't been for a long time, but that stuff still resonates because people are still referring back to this old work. That's why I think it's great that Larry's, you know, redoing it, right? Uh, Actually writing a a whole new volume on Oswald, which should be out by the end of the year, I hope. Um, You know, we're not sure if Skyhorse is going to take it or it's going to be a smaller publisher, but uh, I've seen some of it, and it's a hell of a refresh, on Lee Harvey Oswald from a very sober point of view. And I think it would be very helpful if people will actually take it for what it is, which is very solid and uh, uh, well-constructed uh, assembly of facts and knowledge about this this character in history. Um, and again, he reassesses and reevaluates his own points of view even in this thing. And uh, one thing you can say about Larry is that he's honest and responsible about the work he puts out. And I think this is going to be probably, you know, a lot of people are going to hate him over it. But uh, but I think it's going to be a great book when he actually releases these uh, Oswald puzzle pieces or the Oswald puzzle, whatever they're going to call it. Uh, it it's going to be a hell of a book, man. You. So I appreciate him a lot. Absolutely. And just through his uh, talks on this very show, you know, this is kind of what helped me. I was like, doggone it, you know what? This may sound crazy, but I think Lee Harvey Oswald was actually pretty darned liberal. Mm. In some ways. In some ways he was, uh, you know, a mixed bag, like most people that are sane really are, where you don't get, you know, absolutely lockstep with the prescribed whatever. Um, you, you, you got a mixed bag here. He was a guy who was not happy with the way the system treated him. And if you think about his early experiences well, I, in life, go ahead. I agree he was, I agree he was being used, but yeah. I think that he thought he was doing right things but i think he absolutely was a leftist yeah i think but but again from a misguided point of view you know your own experience and i've tried to explain this on this very show often is that your own experiences will shape how you view things and you know oswald the way he came up he had this mother that had some kind of personality disorder He's, you know, being sent to orphanages, and he's a truant, and, you know, he's got a learning problem. I mean, he's got all kinds of things going on, and the system is not helping him, and the people around him are not helping him, and his family around him is not helping him. So what does he seek to do to be a contrarian? You know, and was he legitimately like a Castro supporter? I don't know. Uh, I'm not certain about that, but for a guy to kind of you know, be chafing against the American system the way it is, if his own experiences shape the way he sees it, maybe it makes a lot of sense that he does that. You know, just saying, it's a possibility. And again, I'm not going for the whole, he's a James Bond type character, or he's the mastermind of anything. Whether, you know, you want to say he's the assassin, or he's... I think the man, I think he's... I mean, everyone that pretty much agrees he was being used. I like his mother's comment when she quoted him, when she says, well, what did you come back for? And he said, not even Marina knows that. <laughs> I'm like, well, that pretty, much, that pretty much sums up Oswald. Vagary. Yeah, vagary, confusion, and quite honestly, he was 24 when he died, so was he fully matured even in his ideas, his orientation, his person in general? No. He was 24 years old when he got that gut shot in the basement there at the Dallas, uh, you know, public safety building. So, 
Dude, if you're 24 years old, you still got a lot to learn, and you might have a couple of chips on your shoulder. Maybe that was him, and maybe that's all it was, and somebody used him. Now we need to figure out why. Um, You know, but as it goes, we should be honest about the character he, he was, as opposed to trying to build him into something or, you know, writing fan fiction about lost romances. Anyways... I'm going to go ahead and close out, Danny, with you. Uh, give Jimmy James a final word and then give BP a final word. And then, quite frankly, we're going to be on to the age of transition. So, Danny, thanks for calling in. Regular Joe, thanks for calling in. Jimmy James, as always, thank you. But uh, go ahead and drop a final word on us, and then I'll turn it over to BP to close out the show. Thanks for all the other callers. Peace out. There you go, short and sweet from the one and only Jimmy James. And next week, I'll give you an update on his uh, his uh, uh, fan club. So, because I did make contact, but I haven't gotten resolutions on my questions. So, I'll give you the update next week on Jimmy James's fan club on Facebook. BP, go ahead, my friend. What do you think of this week's uh, uh, rather dynamic show? <laughs> Well, you know, I hate it's over. It flies by fast once we get going. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the, everybody that called in, regular Joe and, and Danny and, and Jimmy James, and glad we could have this discussion. I uh, remind everybody again, uh, just like regular Joe did, go to com and hit the donate button and uh, support your local food bank. See if you can do something to help your neighbors out. Other than that, I'm glad we got another week in and looking forward to next week doing it again. There you go. And I concur with everything my co-host said, but also want to tell you guys that I appreciate you. And I do mean you guys in the chat room, you guys just listening to us on the phones, whatever else. If you go to the live chat at Ocelli.com, face shifter to man over there, keeping it alive all the time. Next up is Aaron Franz in the Age of Transitions on Ocelli.com radio. And this weekend, I'm definitely going to have to do some DJ shows because I got some new short attention span DJ theater tracks to roll out. Anyway, thank you, BP, my co-host, and thank all of you because, after all, I'm nearly Ocelli. All of you are the effect. 